everybody. I am so excited to announce today's guest on the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour. His name is Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is a junior Democratic senator of Rhode Island. He has been in office since 2007. A graduate of Yale University and the University of Virginia School of Law, Senator Whitehouse served as Rhode Island's U.S. Attorney and State Attorney General before being elected to the Senate where he served on the Finance Committee, the Judiciary Committee, the Environment and Public Works Committee, and the Budget Committee. He and his wife Sandra, a marine biologist and environmental advocate, live in Newport, Rhode Island. They have two grown children. Without further ado, let's listen in on that conversation. Good morning, Senator Whitehouse. How are you? I'm good, Ming. How are you? Great. I, I also know that you're an architectural major, architecture major at Yale. Um, so even though it's been 30 years since the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, since the passages uh, of the Americans with Disabilities Act, many buildings, uh, as you may know, um, such as apartment complexes, restaurants, various stores, et cetera, are still not wheelchair friendly and not accessible to a lot of people with different kinds of disabilities as well. Um, can you share with us how you think we can increase the efforts to design America in such a way that is more accessible to the country, at least infrastructurally, given your uh, early academic backgrounds? Uh, I think that particularly when we're um, doing projects that are funded with federal revenues, with federal support that are part of a federal infrastructure program, for instance, <clears throat> we should make sure that they are fully ADA compliant and work with the um, design groups to make sure that when uh, standardized designs are uh, <clears throat> adopted, that they are disability sensitive, that the ADA rules are um, at a minimum met and with any luck, <clears throat> we do better than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Th thank you so much. Um, so <clears throat> A well-known statistic uh, that is floating around the uh, disability advocacy world is one in five people in the U.S. have a disability and a billion people in the world have a disability that is accounting for 15%, 15% of the world's population. Um, so do 20 of the uh, people you meet with also have some sort of disability being a representative? What about when it comes to employing uh, staffers? Uh, do you currently or have you, have you ever had any people with physical disabilities working in your office? And if not, would you be open to hiring more people with disabilities in your state or capital offices with the appropriate, of course, and qualified skill sets? Yeah, absolutely. As you know, in my delegation, um, we have Jim Langevin, who as the result of a uh, gunshot injury <clears throat> as a high school student is um, confined to uh, a wheelchair. <clears throat> and he's one of the most um, valuable and effective members of our delegation. Um, and I think he sets an, inc an incredible example for what can be accomplished with perseverance and uh, proper support. As you know, his life is made a lot more uh, convenient and his opportunities are enhanced by having the electronic balancing wheelchair that he has, which I think should be made available to anybody in a similar circumstance. But we've had trouble getting the uh, VA, for instance, to dedicate the funding to providing that particular piece of, of equipment. So I think there are ways to assure that um, we can meet the needs of people with disabilities and bring them into positions of responsibility across the country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With sea level rising um, being a reality, as you know, being a representative of Rhode Island and continues to rise, uh, what does your disaster evacuation plans look like for vulnerable groups, uh, such as people with disabilities who will uh, have a harder time of evacuating quickly? Uh, how have you included people with disabilities in the decision-making and disaster planning process to make sure that you have the best and most appropriate plan in process? The um, local response agencies, um, Rhode Island Emergency Management, and the local first responders um, 
keep a list of those who have uh, particular needs and whether it's an electric shutoff um, and somebody may need to have equipment in their house that is run electronically uh, to support them um, so we know that they are priorities or whether it's people who will have um, a difficulty getting out let's say if their property is flooded and you need to make sure you uh, provide them access out uh, early on that's maintained by the emergency first responders and R Rhode Island EMA and um, my office is more than happy to coordinate if somebody has moved or moved to town uh, to make sure that they get onto those um, lists for um, extra attention and early response. Mm, great. And would you be open to including uh, people with appropriate skill sets, of course, and qualifications with physical disabilities who would be struggling in those real circumstances on those teams and make some efforts to do that? Sure, I'd have no objection to that at all. Okay, great. And so from where I'm looking at, I've done a little bit of research on you um, prior, to, prior to this interview, and it seems that, and it's a very limited uh, focus point, of course, from, from what uh, limited observation. So it seems, seems like a lot of people that you have access to or people that are trying to access you uh, are already privileged groups, such as white wealthy uh, men for a lot of uh, cases. How do you ensure that you get a well-rounded exposure of people from all different groups and, and all different backgrounds, such as people with disabilities, who I'm sure you don't see very often, because I myself, as a person with a disability, don't see people like me very often um, in, in your day-to-day -day work so that you're not functioning, you know, in a bubble, so to say? Yeah, well, the part of my job is outreach and to make sure that I'm not in a bubble. Um, the entire focus of my Providence office is outreach and to make sure that I'm going to visit groups um, and having groups into my office and engaging with uh, uh, events out in the community to make sure that I'm getting as broad uh, an input from my constituents as I possibly can. And I think that's true of most of us in my position. Um, I think, um, particularly if you're a small state senator, it's really hard to be in a bubble because everybody knows you. And when you go to the, you know, a soccer game or to church or to the liquor store or to the supermarket or wherever you go, uh, there are people coming up to you. Um, my schedule is very heavy with meetings because in a small state like Rhode Island, everybody expects that they're going to meet with their senator and they do. And it's a good expectation. So Jack Reed and I, as, as small state senators, I think are um, constantly bathed in different, in exposure to different groups. I think if you're a senator from California or from New York, one of the really huge states, um, it's easier to live in a bubble. You can have one big public event a day. You travel in a cortege, you surround yourself with staff, um, you have press conferences instead of just meeting with folks in the media. So in my world, uh, the notion of a bubble is almost, um, it's kind of a, a <laughs> it, let's just say it doesn't align with my experience. Yeah, I think great. there are people who live, in, who live in bubbles, but small state senators aren't them. Yeah, great to hear that. Um, even with that said, though, some people with disabilities, unless you uh, intentionally go to their homes, they're not going to be able to go to your town halls, people with certain kinds of disabilities. And so, um, and, and making sure to have maybe virtual platforms, which I know you do. You just did a yeah, webinar we yesterday on the coronavirus. Um, and, uh, and we so try to make sure that anybody who wants to participate in my outreach in any way uh, that we can get to them, whether it's uh, visiting or calling or working through the people who they have denominated to represent them. Um, and again, in Rhode Island, I think we're particularly sensitive to the disabilities community because we have the extraordinary example of um, Congressman Langevin. Great. Uh, so uh, the next question is uh, a question that I know you're passionate about. You read, wrote a book uh, about it, Captured, which I, I, I listened to on audiobook. Um, 
So it's been 10 years since, since the Citizens United case, as you know. Um, when can Congress overthrow or veto that decision? How, how is the Disclosed Act, Act getting to being passed so the citizens can know uh, who is donating to which political figures? Um, and if it has come to a halt, uh, what are your plans to resuscitate it and make sure Congress does not continue to run, by, uh, continue to be run by dark money? and uh, special interests. The heart of the Citizens United decision was to say that big special interests can spend unlimited amounts of money in political elections. Um, and that was not a legal determination, that was a constitutional determination, which means that Congress can't overturn it without a constitutional amendment. So, um, one thing we have to do is continue to critique the decision because I think it was a terrible, terrible decision based on false facts and shoddy analysis and um, a lot of improper influence from the very forces who would stand most to benefit from being able to spend unlimited amounts of money in elections. But what you can do, although you can't stop the unlimited money without one of those types of changes, you can make it transparent. You can make it clear uh, who is behind this. Um, there was only one judge in the Citizens United Court decision who said that he would protect dark, what we call dark money, anonymous donors. Uh, eight to one, they said, no, 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 transparency is the, is the baseline here. Now, of course, the court under Chief Justice Roberts has done exactly zero to actually enforce this condition of transparency. And there have been news reports all over the place about how non-transparent it is. It's the most obvious fact uh, in the country on election matters. So the fact that the most obvious fact in the country on election matters is one that they overlook when it comes to seeing about enforcing their decision, that's a very questionable situation. And we need to look into exactly why they're not uh, honoring the terms of their own decision. But it does mean that legislatively, with a bill, we can require big donors to be revealed. And I have a bill, the Disclose Act, that would do that. Uh, we tried to get it passed in the Senate. Every single Republican voted against it. Uh, they are a party that is primarily funded by dark money, so they obviously have a huge interest here. I think um, if we either take the Senate back into Democratic hands, or if we get I think continued outrage about the state of America's um, Congress and the power of special interests, uh, it may end up being something that even Republicans realize they've got to go along with. Uh, but we need to keep the pressure up because if you make it easy for them to ignore the issue, then they will obviously ignore the issue. So that's one of the reasons I've been so aggressive on the subject of dark money. The other reason is that dark money is the tool of choice for the climate denial operation. And as we head towards a climate change catastrophe and Congress sits there doing nothing, there's a reason. And the reason is that the fossil fuel industry is a massive, massive, massive dark money operator. And they use it to silence uh, Congress on uh, climate action. And it's um, really regrettable because we'll pay a price for thousands of years for the corruption uh, that dark money has permitted uh, today. And the Dis Disclose Act? The Disclose Act says if you've given more than 10 grand, you've got to cough up who you are. And we don't allow, you know, those, those Russian nesting dolls, one inside the other, inside the other, inside the other. Uh, often what happens is that you hide behind one Russian nesting doll, and that's as far as you go. Um, and in some cases, we've seen like the Shell Corporation that is funded through the uh, donors trust that got money from a 501c4. The dark money interests stack up their screens and their shields to better hide who they are. So one of the ways in which our bill is written is that you actually have to get back to the individual uh, true donor. And however many hops that takes, however many uh, Russian nesting dolls you have to open to get to the middle of it and find who's really behind the scheme, uh, our bill does that. And I think by um, limiting it to $10,000, it's not going to bother the average donor. How many Americans contribute $10,000 in a race? Not many. 
Um, this is really the big players, people who spend literally millions of dollars to try to get their way in elections. And is it, is it about to be uh, passed soon? Well, it's been passed by the House of Representatives under Speaker Pelosi. It was the heart of uh, HR1, their opening bill, the big government reform bill. And um, we are trying to get it passed in the Senate, but as you know, Mitch McConnell is running a legislative graveyard in the Senate in which House bills, even bipartisan House bills, come and die in the drawers of his desk uh, while he's busy stacking the courts with judges, um, which is yet another dark money operation. Um, so this business of dark money has been extraordinarily corrosive to our American democracy. And if there's a simple way to get America back, it's to get rid of this damn dark money. Because once you put, let's just say that it's ExxonMobil who's up to no good, just to pick somebody at random, Marathon Petroleum, pick your, pick your center. Um, let's say they were willing to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars in dark money because they know they can hide that it is them. Because when the dirty advertisement against their adversary runs, it comes through as paid for by, you know, Rhode Islanders for peace and puppies and prosperity or some fake front. Um, so they will spend a lot of money if they can hide it. But if the ad at the end of the day has to say, ExxonMobil brought you this advertisement, then they're gonna pay a price for the lies in the ad. They're gonna pay a price for being anti-climate. They're gonna pay a price for uh, their actions as they should in a responsible public democracy. So um, I think a lot of the dark money goes away once the spotlight of transparency shines on it. The cockroaches scuttle when the lights come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, hopefully. So um, the next hopefully. one's on <laughs> the the next one's on climate change. Uh, I know that. You've given 268 time to wake up uh, speeches at least that I can see on YouTube. Maybe there's been more. Um, no, have, that's it. Um, have you woken anybody up during these 268 weeks? Um, if yes, who and what decisions have been taken because of these weekly speeches? Yeah, it's hard to connect um, specific speeches to specific actions, but I do think the relentless pressure um, that I've helped bring has been helpful. It's been helpful in a couple of ways. First of all, um, in my caucus, it has helped kept interest in this alive. When I started giving these speeches, uh, we had a Democratic president who refused to even talk about climate change. And we had a Democratic Senate that had allowed Speaker Pelosi's cap and trade bill to just die in the Senate with no effort. We were a majority in the Senate, we did nothing. So it was very, very frustrating. And that's when I started. And um, so part of it has been just keeping the issue alive. Part of it has been focusing on the dark money stuff. I've been able to get you know 20 colleagues to the Senate floor to show how this dark money scheme works, um, to put pressure, for instance, on the United States Chamber of Commerce, which turned into one of the worst climate obstruction organizations in America. Um, but once we really started calling them out, a lot of their members started to say, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't sign up for this. What the hell are you doing being one of the worst two climate obstructors in America? And so now they have a big internal fight going on with their membership about why they were corrupted by the fossil fuel industry to do this. That wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been doing these efforts. And then finally, there's a lot of bipartisan work that is starting to emerge. I have um, a group of Republican senators I have regular private conversations with about how to get them public, how to get them out there, how to move. And then on uh, a number of bills, I've got a bipartisan bill on industrial emissions. I've got a bipartisan bill on blue carbon, uh, ocean sequestration of carbon. I've got a bipartisan um, bill on agricultural carbon uh, sequestration. Um, and there's probably five others that I could name. Um, so it's also helped with the little legislation, those smaller bills that are stepping stones toward the uh, really comprehensive measure that we need to pass to get ahead of this problem. So um, 
There are times when I feel like I'm just banging my head against a wall when I give these speeches. But um, I think on balance, it has been helpful to the Congress to make progress. No, we definitely really appreciate your relentless efforts. You're very persistent, to say the least. Um, so next, my our co-host, Jean Mishner, has a couple questions for you. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for um, that, uh, that information. It sounds maybe like the approach of water dripping on a stone uh, is where that one's heading. And eventually, things will change. Um, I'll yeah, just I think you know, guys in Australia have the same problem we do. We've got, you've got huge um, natural problems. You've got a, a great barrier reef that's one of the wonders of the world that is in terrible, terrible trouble. But you've got a fossil fuel industry that has way too much sway in politics and therefore your politics is out of step with your people. Definitely. We've, we've got wonderful natural uh, just assets, which are actually for tourism, but then also the assets of uh, natural resources. So it's, it's a really difficult situation where um, one can actually lead to the erosion of the other. So um, it is it's a very difficult situation for us over here. Um, but uh, my, my question to you will be around the Green New Deal. Yeah. And because I'm over here, I'm, I'm not across all the details, but um, I, I believe that at the moment you haven't signed up to that deal. Um, and because I'm not across all the information, I wanted to know um, maybe what is what stands between uh, you signing up and uh, what, what would you like to see happen before you do? Uh, I'd like to see what the Green New Deal, I'd like to see an actual bill. The Green New Deal has not turned into legislation yet. Um, it's a conceptual framework for addressing the problem. And as a conceptual framework, I think it has a lot of merit. Um, and I think piece by piece, we're trying to get there. Um, if you look at the last uh, highway bill that actually came out of a Republican controlled public works committee, environment public works committee in the Senate. Um, it had a big EV electronic vehicle infrastructure provision. It had a big coastal infrastructure problem program to address the problem of sea level rise and storm surge and uh, beach erosion and all of that. Um, it had a uh, entire chapter on climate change. So these are new steps and even the Republicans are taking those steps. So I think when we get to a big infrastructure bill, it's gonna be very, very important that concepts that relate to the Green New Deal get into those infrastructure bills. I think the likelihood of passing one big Green New Deal bill is very slim. I think the notion of focusing on the infrastructure and funding bills that we get, also the tax bills because um, tax support for electronic vehicles, batteries, solar, wind, all of that, that's an infrastructure of a kind um, that we need to focus on getting all of that done in essentially every bill that comes up. And so I see the, the Green New Deal as more or less like a compass pointed in a direction and every step that we take legislatively, uh, we should try to honor that compass direction but there is no bill to get behind right now. There is, simply is no Green New Deal bill. And so that's been, I think, a part of the problem. Another part of the problem is that the Republicans have done a much, much better job at counter-marketing the Green New Deal uh, than we have done at marketing it. So <laughs> if you want proof of that, the person who brought a Green New Deal-related vote to the floor of the United States Senate was Mitch McConnell. You know perfectly well he was up to no good when he brought that bill to the, that vote to the floor. It was just on a referendum. It was not on a real bill. Um, but when he's the one who brings it, you know he's seeking political advantage, trying to use it to his advantage. You know that he's massively fossil fuel funded. So we've got to be very careful about playing into Republican hands and uh, not losing ground um, and being strategic. And I think that's another important uh, consideration as we consider uh, Green New Deal legislation. Definitely, there'll probably be a few side steps, uh, a few forward, one back, a few forward. So I think yeah, sometimes we do one out. forward and two back. That's just mm. one, of, <laughs> one of my frustrations. But there we are. Great. 
Um, and just quickly, uh, I've got a question about the um, alternative renewable energy sources. Uh, I know that uh, I saw uh, you were backing a nuclear energy uh, program, um, and I just wanted to hear about your thoughts on the mix of uh, that with other renewables, uh, particularly around when it comes to the safety of nuclear energy. Yeah, um, there are two angles to this. One is, um, I think that it's foolish to shut down safely operating nuclear facilities and replace them with gas powered polluting facilities while we're facing a climate crisis. Um, unfortunately, the weird economics of the energy sector make that an artificially good choice for folks um, because the nuclear facilities don't get a, a penny for the carbon free nature of their power. Um, and the gas fueled facilities that replace them don't pay a penny for the pollution uh, that they cause, the carbon dioxide pollution. So um, they're operating in an artificial environment and it'd be, I think it's, it, it would be a mistake to have the existing safely operating fleet shut down. If they're not safe, shut them down yesterday. I got no problem with that. The second thing is that there are new technologies emerging that uh, stand to be far, far, far safer than existing technologies, uh, whether it's small modular or truly new nuclear technologies. And for me, the holy grail in those technologies is the ability to target them to our existing nuclear waste stockpile and figure out how we turn the existing nuclear waste stockpile into productive energy. If we can solve that technical problem, then we've done a huge valuable service to the world. At the moment, we have exactly zero strategy for dealing with our nuclear waste stockpile, unless you think we're gonna go bury it in a cave in Nevada. Um, but we've tried that for 30 years and Nevada's always said, hell no. And I think if you've had 30 years of failure, it's time to rethink. We don't have plan B. So to me, letting innovation try to figure out how you turn that dangerous hazardous waste into something productive um, should be a, like a massive task for our scientific community and for our energy community. Definitely, really looking forward to hearing what comes out of that. Yeah. Great, thank it's you so much. the beginning, there, there are three or four technologies that promise to do exactly that, including one that Bill Gates is backing and he's not a fool. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. So one last question is, how do you balance between leading Rhode Island into a better future, such as tackling climate change and, and a variation of environmental issues and sustaining its well-being now, um, given like the, the perfect example being the current uh, global pandemic, in other words, so when do you focus on putting on current, putting out current fires and versus uh, pushing towards a better and stronger, more competitive future for Rhode Island? Yeah, I think that's the balance that everybody in my line of work faces. If all you do is address the issue of the moment, then you're like a, uh, the second grade soccer team, sorry, Gene, football team, um, in which everybody runs to where the ball is and nobody plays position. Um, and that's not a very good winning strategy at soccer, sorry, football. Um, then, you know, there's a reason that you have strategy. So it's important to do both. The coronavirus has certainly focused everybody's attention on getting through the immediate economic life support needs that having to uh, respond to the pandemic with social distancing required. And I think that's what actually worked really well. I mean, we put $1.8 billion into Rhode Island through the payroll protection plan. We put another billion and a quarter into Rhode Island for the government, state government to use. There's another 350,000 that went in through the emergency disaster loan program. Uh, another, what, 100 million for the hospitals. So that has all been really important in an immediate emergency. Um, I also think though, that people are looking around at how disruptive coronavirus has been and realizing that the ordinary, regular, steady process of life as they know it isn't inevitable. 
that big and bad things can happen. Um, and that's where climate change comes in. It's the big and bad thing stacked up next. And the fact that we're experiencing a big bad thing right now, I think has opened the aperture of the possible for how we can address climate change. And the fact that it took government to respond and that the anti-science, anti-government ideology was completely debunked in all of this, I think has also opened uh, the aperture of the possible. We're at what, three plus trillion dollars in spending uh, out of government, led by government in order to deal with the coronavirus. So both on the risk side, with people suddenly understanding that, wow, big bad things can go wrong. And then on the response side, wow, sometimes government has to do big good things to offset those big bad things. That has opened the aperture for what we need to do on climate. And I think the progress on climate is picking up uh, partially as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Thank you so much for all those insightful responses and for going overtime for us and no waking up early. Um, all those are really much appreciated, Sandra Sheldon Whitehouse. Good to be with you, Ming. Thank you so much. Good to be with you, Gene, a world away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was a pleasure. Pleasure Thank was you. mine. Thank you so much. Have a great day, Senator. You also. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives, keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on another episode of the Traipsing Global on Wheels podcast hour.